<laughs> I was just saying off the record that we've got some juicy sutters and it's a nice subject today. I get excited by this subject, even though it's a subject around stillness, but still, I like it very much, but still, dear me. The English language is a bit strange, but anyway, the reason I like this subject so much is that it's actually all about happiness because the path to stillness is one of happiness. It's not only that, still, that happiness is what you experience in deep meditation, happiness itself is the path into those deep states of meditation. So it doesn't matter where you are on that path, it's just a gradual refinement of happiness, we could say, gradually getting more and more of a taste, a, ref a refined taste for subtle happinesses that at first you might not even realize are happinesses, but later on, you're really not so interested in the coarse stuff anymore. So Ajahn Brahm said quite a lot about this, but today, of course, we're talking about samadhi in the context of the indriyas. And so it's the fourth one of those spiritual faculties or powers or indriyas faculties, basically. And samadhi can be defined as a state of stillness, absorption, um, a kind of union of the mind with its object. And it's found, you know, these states are found and described in many religions, many traditions by some of the great mystics. Um, apparently, Teresa of Avila was supposed to have got into some deep meditations and many other people too. You hear about it a lot in the Hindu traditions. Their word for um, deep meditation is dhyana, which is D-H-Y-A-N-A, -A, very, very close to jhana. In fact, it's pretty much the same word. And so... Many people have been experiencing these states. And of course, if, if you have the view of a God or a creator, then you might even perceive it as a union with God because it's so intense and so completely blissful so that the self seems to disappear and gets taken over, if you like, by something much greater, something much bigger. Of course, in Buddhism, we don't perceive it as that, but I'll talk about that in a bit. You could also see it as a kind of inner peace, a deep inner peace that arises from sustained awareness. And of course, as a product of um, virtue, of confidence and of energy in the mind. So this energy starts to become empowered as mindfulness increases. And as the mindfulness increases and the lights go up in the mind, the happiness increases too. Yeah. And that Happiness is a kind of quiet inner happiness. It's not the happiness that's excited or that's coarse. You know, it's not the happiness of the senses, but it's a kind of deep contentment, a sense of everything being just fine. Everything's being everything's good enough, you know, whatever you experience. And of course, even in the process up to those states, it's a gradual training, if you like, in the perception of contentment, really being happy to be where you are so that the process starts moving inside. It's a kind of ingress rather than a progress onto the next stage. Yeah. And I was sitting this afternoon. In fact, I was doing lying down meditation because I was very tired. And I could see how sometimes when the mind starts to get still, there's this kind of sense of a very subtle kind of leaning forward or lurching forward into what's happening next. And then I realized that this was there very subtly. And I just reminded myself to stop. And suddenly the mind just turns a little bit almost on itself and everything just seems to, the breaks go on and the moment just stays for much longer in the mind. So I wanted to talk about what makes Sama Samadhi, um, what makes Samadhi Sama? So let's say a factor of the path, what is right Samadhi? And again, the difference between the Samadhi that we practice as Buddhists and the Samadhi that's maybe practiced in other traditions or religions, which might feel the same, is that this kind of Samadhi is based on virtue. It has a very strong ethical foundation if it's going to be the kind of Samadhi that can actually take you to the final goal of Nibbana. Then that foundation of virtue must be there. And uh, in the suttas, it says... Um, Sila Paribhavita Samadhi Maha Pala Maha Nisamso. And it means the Samadhi that has a foundation in ethics, based on ethics, based on virtue, is of great fruit and is of great benefit. So the word Maha, like Mahayana, is supposed to be the great vehicle, or the chitta that's become Mahagata. Maha always means something great, and the great benefit is that it can actually lead us 
to understanding the Dhamma. So it's not just a happy abiding, although that's very valid as well. Also, Sama Samadhi, of course, is based on right view. Yeah, the right view that, for example, suffering is created, is caused by wanting. So wanting Samadhi and becoming discontent with where we are basically stirs up the mind. We can't develop stillness by wanting and through the winds of discontent that blow the mind all over the place. It's the opposite. So we have to learn that also as part of right view that nothing really belongs to us, right? So there's no real point clinging to anything that arises. And this understanding of non-self can also help to deepen that samadhi. Because if it, none of it really belongs to you, what's the point holding on to it? You know, the Buddha says, abandon anything that's not yours. Whatever's not yours, the body and the mind, just abandon it. It's not worth clinging on to. So when we realize this, it's not a kind of aversion that says, oh, I don't like myself. I have to, you know, um, kind of get beyond the self out of a sense of frustration with oneself or it's not a kind of dissociation that comes from aversion but it's a letting go of the things that don't actually serve you yeah in life so of course the first thing that we're gradually letting go of is the five hindrances and as Ajahn Brahm said this morning the opposite of those are the seven enlightenment factors so we let go of the five hindrances and cultivate the seven enlightenment factors similarly we also um, let go of the wrong kind of happiness. And this is a sutta that I really love, the Arana Vibhanga Sutta. It talks about two kinds of happiness. One that is to be abandoned, that is not beneficial, and one that is to be pursued. So this is really interesting because I think often as Buddhists and perhaps for myself also in my earlier practice, uh, which was more based on equanimity, I didn't think happiness was that important. I was even a little bit suspicious or fearful of it. I thought that maybe if I'm getting a lot of bliss in meditation, I'm not equanimous enough. So if the bliss did start to arise, I didn't really give it much attention. I would basically just break it down and see it as arising and passing away. <clears throat> and that's also a valid practice and it had great benefits for me personally. Um, but it took a while to retrain my mind to realize that some happiness is actually worth um, tuning into and developing some more. So I wanted to read this little passage from the Majjhima Nikaya 139. So again, this lovely big book with all sorts of colorful bookmarks in it, because it's really interesting when you start to get into these suttas and apply them to your practice. There's lots of gems in here. So the Buddha said in this sutta that one of the ways to avoid conflict in life and also conflict within ourselves is to know how to define pleasure, right? Pleasure, is that okay in religion, to feel pleasure? <laughs> and knowing this, one should pursue pleasure within oneself. And then he elaborates on this. So here I'll change the word bhikkhus, which means monks, to the word community, which includes all of us. <laughs> and of course, this would have been passed on for the benefit of all of us here. So he says, there are these five chords of sensual pleasure. What five? Forms cognizable by the eye, that's visual forms. Sounds cognizable by the ear. Odors co cognizable by the nose. Flavors cognizable by the tongue. Tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable. So they're agreeable to us, right? There's a, some kind of satisfaction, some kind of gratification in that, but they're connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. Now the pleasure and joy that arise dependent on these are called sensual pleasure. So hold yourselves in your seats for the next words. <laughs> <laughs> a filthy pleasure, a coarse pleasure, an ennoble pleasure. I say of this kind of pleasure that it should not be pursued, that it should not be developed, that it should not be cultivated, and that it should be feared. So it's tempting here to give a little caveat, because, of course, he's saying this to shake us up in order to tell us that there's another kind of pleasure worth cultivating and that's much more satisfying, much more lasting, much more nourishing than this. 
it's not that he's necessarily judging them to saying they're terrible, they're bad, you shouldn't have any enjoyment through the senses. But what he is saying is that we shouldn't pursue that enjoyment through the senses. So we're not actually going out, looking for it, trying to increase it, um, trying to get, you know, whatever hit you can to kind of bring you out of your despair. It's more the case that it's not leading in the right direction for enlightenment. So he's not saying that, you know, we shouldn't, for example, enjoy our food because part of enjoying food is that you're going to have a healthy body to practice but we shouldn't be cultivating that and that it should be feared in the sense that it can actually obscure the mind from learning about subtler pleasures you know if we're only used to one particular kind of pleasure we might not even notice subtler ones so then of course he gives the other definition of the other kind of pleasure so he says here community quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. One enters ab upon and abides in the first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, and the fourth jhana. So Sama Samadhi is always defined as these four jhanas. So this is what um, right stillness constitutes. And then he describes them further. This is called the bliss of renunciation the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, upasama sukha, and the bliss of enlightenment. As Ajahn Brahm said earlier, it doesn't mean you're enlightened, but the bliss is so close to the bliss of enlightenment that you experience when there are no hindrances in the mind that it's worth that name. But I really love this bliss of renunciation and seclusion because you're not just secluded from sensual pleasures, you're also secluded from the senses themselves. Because again, it's part of dependent origination. When there's no interest in something, when there's no wanting through those senses, then why would they go out into the world and seek their pleasure? They actually start to close down and the mind becomes the place in which we find this bliss of peace. I really love this idea of the bliss of peace because sometimes we don't think of peace as blissful. We think of it as a little bit boring or dull. But again, it's like a, a very subtle um, taste or a very subtle frequency like uh, tuning into a different channel on the radio and after a while you do get a feel for that and you start to see more and more of its beauty of its depth when the lights in the mind turn up so he said that we should cultivate that yeah was that actually written here explicitly one should know how to define pleasure and knowing that one should pursue pleasure within oneself. Yes, that it should not be feared. So happiness is the path, yes? And I would also suggest that as well as happiness as a kind of prerequisite for these deep states of, enlight of um, samadhi and stillness, and of course, enlightenment as well, um, I was thinking about what Ajahn Brown said earlier about this sense of safety, a sense of feeling really okay and at ease and a sense of belonging where you are. I think this is really, really key. And in the suttas, this comes up quite a lot as well, because the Buddha always talked about developing harmonious communities, being around wise spiritual friends, and generally having that sense that the basic needs, your basic kind of requisites are there in life. You know, for the monastics, he said that there are such things as sapaya. It means the basic conditions, which are good for you to practice in. And the Buddha himself said, if you can't find those conditions, or if you find that in a certain place, the unwholesome states are increasing and the wholesome states are starting to diminish, he said, leave and find somewhere else to be. And in one of the suttas, he actually says, leave straight away. But I think in reality, I mean, maybe in those times, it was easy to just leave straight away because people were mo much more itinerant. But in reality, I think it's better to stay with the situation for longer and just see if really the wholesome states are decreasing. And if you find they are after one month, two months, a year or two years, then it's time to make a change. And as well, you know, it's important to have enough ma material comfort Yesterday, I was curious because we talked about how depression has been on the increase, at least probably all across Europe. 
um, including, of course, the UK, which is part of Europe. <laughs> it's not left the continent of Europe. <laughs> and uh, I looked at the statistics for depression, and it was really interesting to see that money did have an effect. So it's not that we don't need a certain level of comfort or a standard of living. And up until about £50,000 a year, people's depression was less. Like, in other words, when you started at about 10,000 a year, which is obviously not enough, the depression was higher. And then as that um, wage increased, the depression decreased. But interestingly, just to sort of show that the Buddha was right after all, there was another experiment done in America, another um, psychological study. And it found that after earnings of about $75,000, which is a little bit less than that 50,000, um, the happiness levels don't increase anymore. So I don't know why it's those kind of figures. Maybe I don't, I have no idea what people really need. Um, maybe that's just the cost of living, a comfortable life where you don't have worries and you can afford sort of a, an expense that comes unexpectedly. Um, you know, you've got a little bit of a safety net, but beyond that, it doesn't make any difference at all. And that suggests that, you know, at this point, we have to start working with the mind. And it's never made any sense to me why there can be such a thing as a millionaire or a multimillionaire or a billionaire, because surely people realize after a while that if they're still not happy, perhaps they should look in a different direction and not just try to get another million or another billion to just waste their time. So it's really interesting to recognize that there are causes for the process and that it's not your fault if it's not working out you can look at those causes and see if you can tweak it a little bit and it's also a natural process the path of meditation is natural it's something that happens when those causes and conditions are in place and that for me is also a really great relief so I wanted to read a little sutta and it's related to a sutta called the Upanisha sutta which has sometimes been described as dependent liberation. You might have heard of dependent origination, which is the way that suffering arises from delusion through to having the senses, the body, and the craving around that feeling and the craving and leading to a future birth. But this sutta, in some places in the sutta, starts with um, suffering. And from there, it takes a different course. It takes us through developing confidence and then developing joy as a result of that. And in another place, in the suttas, a very similar sequence that starts with virtue and non-remorse and then developing joy as a result of that. So it can start in slightly different ways, but it always leads straight to joy pretty much within about two or three links. And this particular one, I forget exactly where it is. I think it's somewhere in the Anguttaras. But this one starts in a slightly different place again. And it's called rivers. <clears throat> so the Buddha says, just as when it rains, the rain pours down in thick droplets on a mountain top. The water flows down along the slope and fills the cliffs, oh, sorry, the clefts, gullies and creeks. These becoming full, fill up the pools. These becoming full, fill up the lakes. These becoming full fill up the streams, the rivers, the oceans, etc. I think it stops at the ocean. So too, when bhikkhus dwell in concord, harmoniously and without disputes, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes, then that leads to liberation through altruistic joy. And altruistic joy is mudita, what many people might know of as mudita. So this is an example of the sequence starting from a basis of harmony and from a basis of belonging in community, a feeling of safety, a feeling that you matter to someone and they matter to you. So you start to undermine selfishness and self-interest and start thinking for the greater good, for the good of your friends, family, society, anyone who's around you. And then they develop um, this mudita, this sense of altruistic joy based on reflecting on one another's good qualities. So they feel very delighted to be living with wonderful people. And they bring that up in their mind to feel happiness and gratitude and gladness for their situation. And this leads to joy. And from this joy, piti arises. So in this particular translation, joy is pamoja. 
and PT is translated, I usually translate it as rapture. I prefer that as rapture. So PT arises. And for one who has PT, the body and mind become tranquil. For one whose body and mind are tranquil, they feel pleasure, sukha. And when they feel pleasure, the mind becomes still, samadhi. So this is a natural sequence. And as I said, it can start also from sila, from virtue, or it can even start from suffering that leads to confidence, inspired confidence, and then that leads to joy. And they always go all the way through to this beautiful stillness, the deep meditations of the jhanas, based on the proximate cause of happiness, yeah, this sukha. And I like to think of that kind of happiness as contentment, actually. I think that's a really great translation for the word sukha. And it's one that one of my teachers, Shaila Catherine, also prefers. So let's go into each one a little bit more in detail and see how we can just, um, let's say, aid the process without getting too involved. Because also in another sutta, the Upanisha Sutta, the Buddha says very clearly that for one with joy, there's no need to make a volition, may rapture arise. Because it's natural if you have joy that rapture, piti arises. And similarly for all the other links, there's no need to make a volition. May they occur, may they arise, because it's very natural that from one, the next one will arise. It's a cause and effect process. It's a sequence of dependent liberation. And I think it's really interesting that he says there's no need to make a volition. I think it also, also means that it's actually pointless to make a volition because you can't bring these things out through force. You can't have them happen because you want them to happen. So there's no need and there's actually no point. You're wasting energy if you think about wanting them to happen rather than putting the causes in place. So as we said in previous talks, this joy arises due to mindfulness and energy and the three kind of feed into one another. So they become like a positive feedback loop or a virtuous cycle, if you like. So the more mindfulness that arises, the more joy and the more joy, the more What's the other one? Energy. And then from the energy, more mindfulness. So these things start to roll around each other and uh, they remove some of these coarser hindrances. So at this point, there's still a few hindrances there, but the coarser ones are gone. And I think for me, the Pomojo, I notice it can happen in the meditation, but it can also be part of our daily life when we start to be in a kind of virtuous circle or virtuous cycle where our body and speech and mental, um, mental habits start to come in line with the Dhamma and start to be um, mechanisms for good. We start to be able to use our body and speech in ways that creates happiness for others. And that brings us a sense of joy, yeah? So we can start to feel this joy in daily life. And then also the minute we start sitting, you know, the minute you get onto the cushion, isn't there a certain joy in the fact that you've given yourself some time? It's just lovely to be able to sit, isn't it? And take a break. So there's a sense of relief there. And if you are sitting and that joy is not arising yet, then the solution is not to necessarily increase it. You may have all already been trying to rouse it, or if you wish, you can do a bit of metta or a bit of reflection on the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. But the best way really is to develop this perception of contentment with where you are. Yes, just realizing that things will start to unfold in their own time as the mind learns to rest in the moment. And so we learn to wait on the moment and tend to that moment with care, with compassion, and with a lot of gentleness as well. We were saying just before this talk began with the co-hosts that uh, when Ajahn Brahm guides the meditations, maybe this time, but also especially on the retreats we've had in person, he talks about what he's doing as he goes through the body. So rather than saying, now you're doing this and you're doing that. He's saying, I am doing this. I am doing that. And uh, sometimes this is so beautiful because as he describes what he is doing and how he's using the mind, I realize just how much gentleness is there. Incredible gentleness. It reminds me of another instruction or like little gem of wisdom he gave me for my last retreat. He said, because um, I said, oh, I think you know, I've got the kindness. I've got quite a lot of kindness towards my mind. I can sort of make peace, but the gentleness is probably not quite there. So it's that third motivation that could be improved. I said, I should be more gentle. And he said, no, be gentler than gentle, which I thought was very beautiful. 
And I thought about that, you know, almost like a koan, not often, but from time to time, I just think gentler than gentle. Wow. It's so hands off, isn't it? It's really because even being gentle is doing something involving some subtle sense of self. But to be gentler than gentle, it's almost like what you're watching doesn't even know you're there. Like that simile of the still forest pool that he talked about with Ajahn Chah and the animals don't even know he's watching. That's really gentle. That really lets things just start to arise and blossom in their own time when they want to, not when you want them. And so from this joy, it leads to PT. And I like to call that rapture. You could also call it rapt interest, the kind of interest that's really um, enthusiastic and almost um, inseparable at this point from the breath or from the practice of metta. You know, you're so interested in it that you want to stay with it and it becomes easy to stay with your object of meditation. So it really sustains the attention on this and you don't really want to look away. Yeah. And then in the Abhidhamma, um, I think it's the Abhidhamma, the Visuddhimagga, it talks about different types of PT, which I think can be interesting from a practice perspective. So there's the kind which is uh, like a shower. So you might feel like sort of shh sensation coming down through the body or maybe through part of the head sometimes I feel my head sort of melting with this tingly sensation or it can be like um pervasive throughout the body and mind perhaps or it can be like a flash so it's just a sudden kind of bolt of joy or it can be uplifting that was another one I thought was quite relevant because today somebody said that um when their mind's getting still, they start to feel like they're sort of floating and the body's probably disappearing quite a lot and you're sort of floating away from it. You know, you're more in the realm of the mind, but you're not yet in the realm of nimittas. And is this PT? Is this PT sukha? And I think it, it probably is. Um, and I've heard other monastics talk about that, actually. There's a nun that I know fairly well in Perth, and she talked about a very similar experience. And uh, she asked Ajahn Brahm at the time, and he knows her very well too. She said, is it Piti Sukha? And Piti Sukha is like rapture and happiness together, which are quite inseparable at this stage. And he said, yeah, it is. But the, your mind hasn't got quite bright enough to feel the joy. You know, it's nice. You know, it's kind of uh, pleasant, but it's a little bit nondescript. It's like, OK, I'm sort of floating. There's this floaty feeling, but it's not particularly like blissful at this stage. But it's just a matter of waiting. And after a while, you know, the the joy of that starts to emerge. It's more like a peaceful kind of joy, but it is a piti. It is a kind of piti sukha. And so at this stage, as I said, it's almost like learning to tune into a different radio frequency. And I remember doing this once on retreat, feeling that <clears throat> things were quite peaceful. My breath was calm. Um, and I thought, yeah, but there's nothing, you know, there's no, ha no particular happiness, just a bit of peace and and then I just, I don't know how this happened, really, because sometimes the mind just shifts slightly, but it just sensed a slightly different frequency behind what was in my main field of awareness. And it was very, very subtle at first, but because I noticed it, suddenly it took over the whole mind. And it was incredible bliss, the kind I've ne had never experienced till that point before. So that really kind of surprised me in a way because it was obviously there before it was just that I hadn't noticed it and sometimes this is the problem isn't it we're looking for something other than what's there instead of really appreciating what we have instead of really noticing what is there and valuing what is there even if it's not very clear it doesn't matter this is your experience this is your object of awareness and only you can take care of it right it's come to see you so now is your time to develop the right motivations and attitudes towards it. And really that's just about sinking more deeply into where you already are. Yeah. As soon as we want to go somewhere else, we give discontent a chance to arise. And so there's a few things that can happen at this point. And I wrote down a few things uh, to be aware of. One of them comes from Ajahn Brown's wonderful book, uh, Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond. So, I don't know if it's from the book, but I call this the troubleshooting guide. So <laughs> the first thing he says that can interrupt the PT at this stage is trying too hard. <laughs> so either trying too hard to hold on to the PT that's arisen or trying too hard to have it arise. So he says this. 
When pity does not arise, it must be because there's not enough contentment. That is, one is still trying too hard. One should reflect on the first two of the hindrances. Sensory desire draws attention to the object of desire and thus away from the breath or away from the metta or away from whatever you're doing. Ill will finds fault with the experience of the breath and the dissatisfaction repels the attention from the breath. Then this bit I love. Contentment is the middle way between desire and ill will. It keeps one's mindfulness with the breath long enough for PT and sukha to arise. Isn't that great? I really love that as a description of contentment, the middle way, or if you like, somewhere between. I would say it's actually a different direction from desire and ill will. It's almost like desire and ill will are here and contentment's going through them in a different direction. Like really a radical state of mind, isn't it? It's completely against the stream of the way society tries to compel us and pull us. It's really quite a rebellion to say, this is good enough. Can you do that even when you've got a migraine, even when you have anxiety coming up, even when you're really tired and you're trying to give a talk and you have to keep clearing your throat? <laughs> can you really say this is good enough? Yeah. And if you can, then that's a drop in the jar of the contentment, isn't it? So I really like that. Contentment is the middle way between desire and ill will. It keeps one's mindfulness with the breath long enough for PT Sukha to arise. So this is one way of respecting your practice, isn't it? Staying with it, being with it, keeping it company. Someone asked about how to respect their practice. That's one way. You know, just the way you'd respect a friend. Think of your objects of meditation like your friends. How would you respect a friend? You give them time. You wouldn't try to change them. You'd listen to them. You'd stay with them, even if they were suffering, even if they were crying. You know, you wouldn't say, I only want to see you if you're in a good mood. You'd say, it's okay. You can come to me anytime, even if you're going through hell, right? So how about our mind and mind objects? Can we say that to them too? Another thing that can happen and sort of sabotage whatever PT Sukha has arisen or whatever PT at this stage has arisen is a kind of feeling of um, resistance because you don't feel you're allowed to feel happy, or it could even be a sense of um, a low self-worth, lack of self-esteem that feels you don't deserve to be happy. And it's interesting for me because I've never really felt I don't deserve to be happy, but sometimes there's a feeling like, have I done enough work to be happy? Like, shouldn't I be sitting for longer before happiness arises? Have I really put the causes in? Like some kind of doubt, I suppose, isn't it? Like the happiness is there, but it's like, hmm, sort of do I deserve, I guess. Like, is it really time for this? Have I done enough work? Have I been a good girl? You know, that kind of thing. Because <laughs> certainly in my childhood, I felt I had to get straight A's to get a chocolate bar. Because I mean, I'm very glad I've got good teeth. I don't have any fillings, you know, because I didn't get many chocolate. I got a lot of chocolate bars from my grades, but that was it. <laughs> I didn't get them otherwise. So <laughs> I had to be a good girl. I hope my mom and dad aren't listening. But anyway, it was good because I've got very strong teeth. And uh, but, you know, I do have that sort of over conscientiousness about me and that sort of wanting to be always on good form. And I'm sure it's the same for many of us. And sorry for people here who are male and who have this too, or who are gender non-binary or trans who have that too, but it's often a, a female thing as well because we just have to work a bit harder in life. <laughs> we don't always have the same opportunities. Another thing that can happen at this time is that the PT is there, but you fault find with it. So you think, okay, this is PT, but it's not pervasive PC, PT. It's just momentary. It was just like a flash, you know, it's not good enough for me. So this is the fault finding mind. And again, it shows there's not enough contentment. And if it really winds you up, you could practice metta, or you could just have an attitude of metta that embraces what is there. So this sense of embracing the moment, you know, unconditionally, whether you like it or not and then impatience can happen too because now your meditation is starting to take off Ajahn Brahm calls this the pivot point of meditation because you're starting to enjoy what you're doing you're starting to have genuine interest in the breath and uh, unfortunately at this point we can get impatient and think oh what's going to happen next or the usual question what do I do next 
what do I do next? So we forget the openness of sutta that says one does not need to make a volition, may tranquility arise because it's natural that once you've had your fill of PT, once you've had the rapture and it's run its course, then tranquility will arise if you just stay quiet and you stay with it and you stay present for it. And if it fades away, it fades away. If it develops into more tranquility, then very good. So either way, it's good because we're learning about the mind and how it works. So the next stage is pasadi, which is tranquility. And this in the Buddha's text, Buddhist text is likened to um, someone lost in the desert, like that analogy earlier, someone parched and desperate and terribly hot. And they suddenly find the shade of a tree and oh, so cool to sit here and you go, oh, just relax and everything gets still. Yeah, so it's a kind of deep serenity that arises as the mind quietens and settles down some more. And at that point, you don't want to move, you know. So if you are meditating and the bell goes, you think, oh, I don't really want to open my eyes. It's almost like your eyes, it's too much effort to open your eyes. And you just want to sit for hours. It's really nice when this happens. It happens especially in hot countries, because if you move, you get even hotter. So you just end up sitting for hours. And then that leads to the sukkha, the happiness, which is the proximate cause for deep jhanas. And that happiness is likened to a lake. So it's the same person in the desert. He was sitting or she was sitting under a tree and now they plunge into a cool lake of water, which imagine the relief. So it's actually delightful. It's, it's something very uh, refreshing for the mind. And it's born of that tranquility. So it's not an excited kind of bliss. It's not an excited kind of joy. It's a joy that's born of tranquility, but it's even sweeter than that tranquility. It's very sweet, almost rounded. Like, I don't know, I can't say I hated wine anyway, but it's like a rounded cup of tea or it's like a, <laughs> a very nicely, um, a nice cacao bean or something. It's, a <laughs> it's quite refined and it's very fulfilling. Yeah, it's satiating for the mind. And at this point, nimittas might arise, but it doesn't matter if they do or not. If they don't arise, the danger is you'll be thinking, oh, why aren't they arising? And then you disturb it that way. If they do start to arise, then sometimes we might try to go towards them too soon or try to grab onto them. Or what is also very common is that fear or excitement can arise. So out of all the upakilesas, in that upakilesa sutta, I think it's Majjhima 118, if anyone wants to read it. Um, there are many things that can arise, like discontent and um, weariness and things like this. But the main two are the fear and the excitement, because now it's almost like something's coming to take over your mind. I mean, it's not really, but it's just a powerful experience that you wouldn't be used to. And Ajahn Brahm said it's almost like you've been used to driving an old bomb of a car and now you have like a really fast sports car I don't know I mean I don't relate to similes of cars but it's like something that's almost too much for you you know you don't know how to control it but of course as usual the best thing to do is just stay content stay present and stay still yeah and then of course that can go into the jhana states through the nimittas and into the jhanas where everything gets so content that you can't move even if you want to move but of course you don't want to move so nothing moves and you can stay in that for many hours and uh and yeah those uh jhana states are where the hindrances are fully overcome and from there the mind does become soft it becomes like that molten gold that's malleable that you can um, use for whatever purpose you want to use it for so the buddha says the mind is now fit for work and what does that mean it really means fit for the work of seeing things as they truly are so from samadhi we see things as they truly are yata bhuta jnana dasana not as you want them to be not as you expect them to be not as you don't want them to be but as they are so truths such as impermanence suffering and non-self that you might think you understand but that you haven't understood deep enough yet. So now you have more data to understand them at a deeper level. And of course, this is an ongoing process for everyone. And um, it's only really when you break through to stream entry that you fully understood uh, non-self and also suffering and impermanence. I mean, you understand that everything that arises 
um, passes away. Yeah, all that is conditioned to arise, all that has the nature to arise, has the nature to cease. That was uh, Kondanya's realization, the second person after the Buddha to break through. So he became a street mentor by seeing that everything of the nature to arise has the nature to cease. And that's everything. There are no exceptions because there's nothing that's just here without having a condition for it, or there's nothing that's here without having a risen, right? I mean, if there's something here, it's a risen. That's why it's here. So, and that all has the nature to cease. And from that, it's really interesting because another process happens and the next step is called Nibida. It's a kind of turning away from the sensual world. It's a kind of turning away from um, suffering, basically. It's uh, the mind is repelled from suffering. It doesn't want to play in that realm of suffering anymore. And instead it turns towards the path of peace. And from there, Viraga happens. It's a kind of dispassion where things start to fade because you just don't give them the attention. You're not interested, you're not fueling them anymore. And it's not a sad thing because you got something remember so much better already. So it's almost like a child that gives up its toys. You know, it's not sad when the child gives up the toys, they give it up because they want to read a book now. Or, you know, when you give up your children's books, then you want to read, I don't know, a dumber book. You don't feel sad that now you don't read children's books. It's just that, you know, you've got a better book to read, <laughs> isn't it? Same with music, you know, first you like, I don't know, I always liked rock music, but apparently Adrian Brown progressed quite quickly onto classical which I find quite irritating. But anyway, I left England at 19, so I didn't have chance to become sophisticated in terms of musical choice. <laughs> anyway, it's a bit of a joke between us, but um, I think Led Zeppelin is very sophisticated. Anyway, and then from the dispassion, the fading away and the not fueling the process, what happens? Everything ceases and that's Niroda, where things stop. So the Buddha taught, suffering and the end of suffering and this is what he, what stops is the suffering that stops so there's really no need to be afraid but on the way to that suffering stopping there's so much bliss to be had and that bliss starts with virtue it starts with non-remorse it starts even with suffering the suffering that can lead to confidence in the teachings and that can lead to that motivation to put them into practice yeah the happiness that starts with being happy with our companions rejoicing in one another's good deeds you know, living virtuous lives, supporting each other to feel safe, to feel that we matter, that we belong, that we have something meaningful to share. And then meditating, putting that joy into the mind and allowing this process to unfold. So I'm sure Arjun Brown will talk about it more tomorrow, but that was um, hopefully helpful, at least with some of those uh, stages of happiness on the path towards deep meditation. He can give a lot more detail than me on the really deep stuff. So I will leave it there. And whoops, we're meant to do meditation, aren't we? I've talked quite a lot, but we still have time. So we have to be content with whatever we've got. <laughs> Please excuse me if I get enthusiastic about that subject. I quite like it. I also had a very nice chat with the co-host beforehand, which made me feel supported as well. So I was feeling quite a lot of joy. <laughs> so any happiness you have in your mind, in your heart, see if you can gently invite it inside. You don't need your eyes to rejoice in one another's company. You know that we're here. We're all here together. Hopefully, you know that you're safe, you're respected and valued. And that there are many people like us throughout the world who love the Dhamma, who rejoice in the Dharma and who are committed to developing the wholesome and the good. This should make you very happy.
so many human births and we never find the Dhamma. Who knows all the kind of sufferings we've been through before. Whatever we experience now is quite trivial in the context of so many lifetimes or even suffering you've had in this lifetime up till now. So rejoicing in a beautiful sense of belonging to this perhaps temporary community, but one you can tap into again and again, maybe slightly different people, but we share the same Dhamma heart. and letting the mind just settle as though the awareness is just pouring over your body almost like honey dripping down. Or maybe like the golden rays of sunshine basking your body in their warm and radiant light. And picking up any sensations, any feelings, whether physical or of the mind, that are pleasant, or that are simply good enough. Creating them all as a friend. Treating every experience with respect. <laughs> and allowing the mind to savor the present moment. A moment that you've never experienced before that passes away so quickly you'll never experience again. See if you can stay so still. that the present moment 
starts to expand. As though the mind were going right into the center of time. Just resting lightly. Allowing things to slow down. There's a beauty to being present, a simplicity, peace. Can this moment be good enough?
And if the breath comes to visit, be contented to let it in and just to rest contentedly with the breath. Noticing the beautiful simplicity of simply breathing in, breathing out. No effort is needed at all. And the contentment is so deep that you're equally content if the breath doesn't stay. Simply enjoying this moment. Enjoying the peace.
And as you notice peace in the mind, however much or little bit there is, see if you can tune in to the happiness of peace, that special refined taste that's subtle and that's free. Just simply noticing peace. And the happiness of peace. This is good enough for me. So we're coming close to the end of the meditation. But if your mind's still, and you don't want to come out, that's fine.
just noticing peace for a few more moments. And staying centered in that place between desire and discontent. Protecting the peace in your heart as you gently open your eyes, if you wish. Knowing that peace is always right there in the center of this present moment to return to whenever you need it at any time. No resonance. <laughs> I can hear ding. I can hear a lot of resonance. Anyway. So now you're so peaceful that there's no questions, I'm sure. <laughs> but you never know. So We'll see how we go. If there are a lot of questions, I'm happy to stay an extra 10 minutes because I talk too long. <laughs> and anyone that wishes to go is fine. Um, also, I just put in the correct Sutta reference because I said 118 and that's actually the Anapanasati Sutta. So um, it's actually the 128 or Bukilesa Sutta about working with fear and excitement and all the other things. Okay. Can sound be a limiter? This afternoon when I was in deep meditation, I heard a sound like monsoon rain for a second right on my yoga mat. I'm in England, no rain and no rainmakers at home. In fact, I'm alone at my home. My hearing has become much more intense for a couple of days. It's become a bit annoying to hear all the heating pipes creak. This almost became difficult to cope this afternoon when I had to change to walking meditation, then stop it a bit and give myself a talk about not being able to control things. <laughs> you can't control yourself either, though, or your hearing. <laughs> is it normal to get a bit sensitive? This is not the usual me. <laughs> yeah, there is no real usual you. I know what you mean, but... Um, it's completely normal. I mean, if you are becoming sensitive, that's um, it's part of the process. It's part of the process because the senses are kind of, before they disappear, they kind of turn up. It's like we become much more attuned to everything that's happening. And um, I guess we can easily perceive things as disturbances because our mind is developing this inclination to go deeply inside. So there is this inclination and we are inclining to that and enjoying that. And so there's also a little bit of craving towards it. So when we do feel we're pulled out by something like the creaking pipes, a little bit of irritation can come up, but that's completely normal, it really is. Um, I mean, it's happened to me before on retreat that um, once I went on my personal retreat at Jana Grove, I mean, I'm, I'm there for three months, but then you have two weeks, which are really solitary. So someone else brings the food and everything. And during this time, I happened to notice that the roof was really noisy and it just kept banging every time the heat sort of heated it up. And uh, it's like, wow, I didn't really realize that before. Now I've got to spend two weeks just listening to this roof kind of explode again and again. And, uh, and that night, uh, unrelated to the sound but I guess I saw that there was a little bit of irritation and tension and I, some compassion arose and I just started doing walking meditation and practicing metta on the walking path and uh, some old trauma came up actually while I was walking and I um, just imagine myself giving this younger me who was quite traumatized a lot of loving kindness and some tears came down 
probably because when we are reacting, you know, there's a sort of suffering in there. And so these uh, tears came down. And then um, the next day, my heart was much softer. My mind was much less reactive, less brittle. And honestly, I don't know, I'm pretty sure the roof would still be banging, but I hardly heard it at all. And when I did hear it, there was barely any reaction. It was like it was hitting a very soft sponge and it was just kind of being absorbed or, you know, just not really, or you could say it's like a, it was hitting something hard, hard and sort of contained and it was just bouncing off, you know. So it didn't really disturb me too much. So don't worry about that. I mean, we are more sensitive when we meditate and, um, and it's fine, you know, it's just about attending to whatever's coming up and forgiving yourself. I mean, when you say you were giving yourself a talk about not being able to control things, I mean, there's wisdom in the fact that yes, we're not able to control things, but giving yourself a talk sounds a little bit <laughs> like telling yourself off. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes that intellectual knowledge doesn't go quite deep enough. What's really needed is that bit of care. And it's almost as though, because we've cared for ourselves, we're more receptive then to our own, um, telling each other off if that makes sense <laughs> like we're a lot more receptive because we've actually cared for ourselves first we feel safe with ourselves already and then can sound be a limiter yes it kind of can um yeah i can't say too much about my experiences but i did once hear something quite amazing a long time ago and um i mean i didn't even know about things like limiters at that point so i just thought oh that's interesting i thought nothing much of it i mean i thought it was very beautiful like some sort of incredible chanting with about five or six different layers. It was really very beautiful. And um, uh, but I just thought, you yeah, know, you know, it's the mind doing whatever it does. So yeah, don't worry about it. I mean, it's it's not really that important because if it's a limiter you can use to go deeper, it will stay and it will brighten and it become very obvious and very stable. So the two main signs that a limiter is worth um, giving attention to, and the mind will do it anyway, but is its stability and its beauty. So if it's not even stable, just let it come and go just like anything else. And um, you don't need to follow it too much. I mean, it might be that because to you, that's a nice sound. If you are going to sort of develop sensitivity in that way, you'll hear something that you like. So it probably does show that your mind's becoming quite beautiful and um, sensitivity is part of that. It's just, we have to care for ourselves all the way in. You know? So don't tell yourself off, be kind and be sensitive to the sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Good. Someone needed that talk, that's wonderful. Uh, I just quickly check how many messages are in each. Okay, all right. Uh, I feel like in meditation, I'm indulging, allowing bad characteristics like laziness and sloth to arise. And I'm a little afraid that they will overcome me. Is this normal in the beginning? Or I just need more to be mindful and don't let these things in or overcome me. I feel often depressed and low down and can't find the meaning in things after meditation. I'm a little bit afraid. Please help. Oh, yeah. I understand this feeling also because my energy is quite low these days, believe it or not. I know I can come across and give a, a nice energetic talk, but actually deep inside, I'm quite sad and quite tired too. And I feel a little bit similar in my meditation at the moment that um, this can be kind of like a sinking feeling. But I think it's just that you are genuinely tired because depression is often the outcome of just a real loss of energy. And so many people are burnt out. They're really dealing with many things. And um, really your mind's just asking you to, you know, to rest. So I wouldn't really worry too much about it. Um, I mean, one thing you could do is just try and really enjoy the resting, you know, and maybe rest between the meditations much more. So, for example, like in your spare time or in any time that you don't want to sit and meditate, just rest as much as you can, like flat on your back or however it's comfortable for you. And just, you know, spread loving kindness or spread awareness through your body in a kind way, just as though 
you are spreading healing energy through your body. You can imagine it like healing energy, just really taking care of every part of you and giving yourself a rest. And then you might find that in meditation, you're not sleepy, but if you are, it's fine. I mean, really, it's just about being kind to yourself and allowing this to be. Sometimes we think that the meditation is not working and that, oh, I've just been tired all week and nothing really happened. I didn't get very mindful. But after the retreat, you might find that you feel quite different than before. You might, you might not. It doesn't really matter. Um, but just be kind to yourself. Be kind to the fear and don't worry at all. Sometimes it's just nature taking its course and things work out themselves. So I don't know if that really helps, but please ask it again and maybe ask it to Ajahn tomorrow because he'll definitely suggest, I'm sure, that it's fine and not to worry about it and at least take that mental anxiety away. So this afternoon while practicing, I could see electric blue and white swirling shapes with concentric rings and my body was very much in the background, then static with dots. I stayed with the colors and had a sense of wanting to fall forward and into them. Then I felt like I was enveloped by a warm, luminous fog while my mind was super clear and peaceful. Later, similar, but with faint stone archways and landscapes inviting me onwards. Can you say anything about this? <laughs> it's really interesting, isn't it? Like when these things happen, because obviously you're giving it a lot of description. So you're very, very aware. And it was quite interesting. It was also quite complicated in a sense, but it was, it does seem it was progressing sort of inward, which is a good thing. Um, you say you stayed with the colors and had a sense of wanting to fall forward and into them. So this is great. I mean, it seems like your mind is getting still with it and accepting it. And um, yeah, it's almost like sometimes like a kind of magnetic pull. And then you were enveloped by a warm, luminous fog while mind was super clear and peaceful. So yeah, it's a kind of nimitta. And then stone archways and landscapes inviting me onward. Interesting, yeah. I mean, it's just that um, they're nimittas, but because there's quite a lot happening, it's like your mind might not be used to staying with something simple. So it keeps on sending out more different interpretations for whatever it finds beautiful. Um, so it's a bit similar to what I described yesterday of when I had this landscape with a kind of, it wasn't an archway, but the nature was like an archway and there was a path underneath and it was like inviting me in. So, but I also knew that it was kind of unlikely to take me that far because it was still quite complicated. So just, just be with it. I think you're doing the right thing. You know, you're, um, doesn't seem like fears coming up. It seems like, um, you know, you're staying present and you're just observing the process. The mind's clear and peaceful. So, yeah, good. Just let it continue. And at some point it might be that that simplifies and that there may be one simpler shape at some point that really calls you towards it. So, yeah, don't resist if that happens. Um, I mean, Ajahn Brown did tell me that I, you know, could have gone down that um, path, even though I didn't think it was... Um, you know, ready for me yet, but you never know. Just let the mind decide. Don't try to control the process. Uh, when when taking up the precept of not eating in the when we're taking up the precept of not eating in the afternoon after the retreat, should we keep away from meetings involving eating in the afternoon? <laughs> if you really want to do it, then that might be helpful. Um, I mean, see how you go with it, because if you are busy in the world and doing a lot of physical work, it might be quite difficult to keep that precept all the time. There's other ways you can do it. I mean, I'm not discouraging you. If you really want to, there's a way to, you know, you can. And you can make sure you eat more in the breakfast, a really good meal for bre like a nourishing breakfast and a really good nourishing meal for lunch. Make sure it's warm, make sure it's moist and nutritious, and this will keep your digestive system well. Um, and then, yeah, if you really want to do it and you're finding it difficult and you'll find out for yourself. I mean, sometimes people like yesterday were cooking here and it smelled really nice, but I'm so used to not having it now. So it doesn't really bother me. But in the beginning, it, it'll be probably easier to keep away from that, depending how determined you want to be. But if after a while you find that, you know, you're actually getting weak and that you're not getting enough nutrition and the craving to join in with people is just too strong, then give yourself a break and maybe 
think about doing it a couple of days a week you know sometimes people do it once a week like on the opposite days like the opposites are like every two weeks but you could also do it once a week take eight precepts so it's not that it only succeeds if it's every day it's all practicing good restraint and i think it's probably coming from a fair bit of inspiration in the practice and the path so that's great you have good intentions see how it works for you someone dear and close to me is dying right now i can't be with him because there's a snowstorm right now and is that comma no that's not comma that's weather and is there a chant that you would recommend for me to dedicate for my own home thank you now the reason i said that's weather is not a flippant comment it's because the buddha does talk about um i think it's Oh, now I forget. And I can never find this place in the suttas. I think it's six or eight. I think it's eight causes for things to happen. I know that three of them are like what we call in Ayurveda, the three doshas. So that's any disease caused by basically vata, which is like people call it the air element, but it really means the kind of, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, when things are breaking down, it's the aspect that breaks things down. Catabolize, catabolism okay and then there's pitta which people call like mm, the fire element but it's more than that that's more like metabolism you could say and then there's pit, uh, kapha which is like the earth and water element and that is like uh, anabolism so that's like when the body is becoming sort of more bulky it's things like mucus anyway um, I did study Ayurveda at degree level, so but I've forgotten a lot of it. Um, anyway, those three are there as causes. So this is basically the things that happen in the body to create disease when they're out of balance. And then there's something like weather. <laughs> and then there's accidents or carelessness. Um, it might be two, actually, accidents and carelessness. What else? One, two, three, four, five. It might be that there's only six. Anyway, one of them is comma. Only one of them is comma. So when people say, oh, everybody died in a typhoon in this particular part of the world, was that their comma, you know? Actually, there's no women in the suttas, as far as I know. And I think Ajahn Bhamali would agree that the Buddha talks about group comma because comma is individual. Even yesterday in the recollections, we um, I read that recollection out about, I am the owner of my comma, heir to my comma, abide supported by my comma whatever karma I shall do for good or for ill, of that I shall be the heir. So that karma is your karma. And um, it's not some kind of punishment. Karma is not a punishment. And it's also not the kind of thing we can infer backwards. So it's not that we can say, well, this is happening now. It must have been because of something that happened in the past. The purpose of it is to know that what we're doing now will have an effect. So it's more of a forward thinking thing. So for example, if somebody's poor in this lifetime, we can't say, oh, it must be because they did bad karma. Or if somebody's maybe born with a disability or a learning disability, oh, they must have done something bad in the past. It's not to infer backwards. It's more that if you do something bad in the past, if you have done something bad in the past, it will have certain results. Yeah. So that may be one of the possible results, but it might not be. Does that make sense? So it's like, you can't say that if somebody's suffering now, it's necessarily due to certain um, past karma. We just don't know. <clears throat> Even the Buddha said it's impossible to say, you know, exactly what karma's caused what. And it's just too much of a minefield. So it's really important not to think that this is anything going wrong or anything bad karma or um, that there's anything that could be done because it's just one of those unexpected weather events. And this is also it has its own causes, you know, it's causes in nature. Oh, great. So Derek's found that reference, Samyutta Nikaya 3621. I'm wondering, Derek, if you've got it there in front of you, if you could actually read out those six, would you mind? Or six or eight? Would you be willing or do you want to put in the, yeah, great, awesome. Uh, shall I just, yeah, you read those out and then I'll finish the second question. Just reopening it. I got such a good team. So this is Bhante Sajato's translation. Master Gotama, there are some ascetics and Brahmins who have this do doctrine and view. 
Everything this individual experiences, pleasurable, painful or neutral, is because of past deeds or past actions. What does Master Gautama say about this? Sivaka, some feelings stem from bowel disorders. You can know this from your own personal experience, and it is also generally agreed to be true. And then there's some more talking about this, and then there's some more options. Some feelings stem from phlegm disorders, wind disorders, their conjunction, changing weather, not taking care of yourself, overexertion, and some feelings are the result of past deeds. Great, thank you. So hopefully that gives you some reassurance. And um, yeah, it's a, it must be difficult that somebody dear and close is dying and you can't be there. Um, but you can be there in terms of meta. So you can actually imagine that you're with this person and just hold them in your heart and send them lots of loving kindness. So is there a chant that I would suggest? Um, I mean, it has to be something that means something to you, I think. So if you understand Pali and you find Pali inspiring, you could try and um, chant the Loving Kindness Sutta, the Karaniya Metta Sutta, or you could try it in English, um, if it works for you, because really the important thing is not necessarily the chanting or the words, but the actual generation of Metta how much sort of goodwill and meta you can try to send this person. But if you send them their name to me, then I'll put them in next week's chanting session as well. Um, we do that every Wednesday and we take name requests so we can help. Um, yeah, if you want to chant the Karaniya Metta Sutta, I've got a lot of recordings of it, of myself chanting it on our YouTube channel, Anupampa Bikuni Project. You could play that. You could meditate to it, or you could learn the words along with it, which is also on our website. So maybe someone could pop in the YouTube channel. It's called Anukampa Bikuni Project. So that's quite easy. I always suggest metta because I think that's what people mostly need. And it's something that we all resonate with. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I won't read that because I'm a bit shy but somebody's writing a very nice message. Oh, good. Thank you for writing that in. And thank you for all your support. Yes, we do have an amazing team, Mia has said. And, uh, and we have amazing participants too. It's just wonderful to be here with all of you. And uh, I can't believe that it's going so quickly. So amazingly, it is actually nine o'clock on the dot. And so you all get to go to bed now, if you wish. And uh, I hope you sleep well. Yeah. And for the person who is really sleepy and feeling quite sad, please practice metta before you go to bed. Just wish yourself well, if you can. Um, and this, you know, even if it doesn't feel like it's doing anything, it's a habit to get into just to speak kind words to yourself. You know, the mind does resonate with those words. It understands the meaning of those words, even if it doesn't immediately overcome fear or depression. You know, you're learning to at least speak kindly and incline your mind in a wholesome direction and you might find that those words come up when you most need them at another time so see if you can do that in the evenings and I would say really don't worry about you know getting anywhere in the practice and don't worry about sending meta to other people it's you who needs the attention so see if you can give yourself that care okay thanks for sending me the name and I shall copy paste it if I'm smart enough or maybe Renny can do that <laughs> then, oh you don't see it okay uh, 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 well you do see it yeah somebody sent me their name anyway if somebody could copy paste that and send it on to me that would be great so good night everybody thank you for everyone's support and sweet dreams take care <laughs>